All right. Hey there, everyone. We're just going to take a moment as folks are tuning into um, Science Bubble. This is Popping the Science Bubble with Berkeley Public Library. Um, thank you, everyone, as you are logging on. Okay. And right now the program is being recorded. Um, we like to archive the Popping the Science Bubble programs on YouTube, and the program is being live streamed to Facebook as well. Let's see if that's working. All right. Okay. All right. Yeah, looks like there's some folks coming in. Thank you, everyone who's tuning in tonight. All right. Um, yeah, hope everyone is having a good week there. Um, Berkeley Public Library is uh, preparing our calendar for uh, August. Um, be sure to check out our event calendar. Um, I, I know we're planning to update it this week. Let's see. All right. Um, so I think I'm going to go ahead and introduce tonight's program. Um, so thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Um, this is uh, Popping the Science Bubble, um, an event in collaboration um, with UC Berkeley Cal students, um, PhD students, and uh, postdoc students. Um, and this is a partnership that uh, Berkeley Public Library is just so happy to host. Um, Popping the Science Bubble is a monthly seminar series that aims to share new research findings from grad students and postdocs at UC Berkeley with the general public and create constructive discussion about a variety of science topics. We have two speakers at each seminar who will talk about their current research or a topic they find really interesting. Uh, the organizers are three graduate students at UC Berkeley, Jenna, Madison, and Oksana. If you're interested to check out the past seminars, you can visit their website, you can check their Twitter, their Facebook, or YouTube, where all of these talks are archived. Um, I encourage you to sign up for the Lister to keep in the loop about upcoming seminar uh, talks, and um, please uh, enjoy this evening, and I'll let our Science Bubble team introduce tonight's speakers. Thank you, Kelsey. <laughs> We're really excited to be here and excited to hear talks from both of our speakers. As Kelsey said, we're a uh, Berkeley graduate student run program uh, that hosts uh, talks for the public uh, once a month, currently on Zoom, hopefully at some point soon hybrid, um, but that's TBD and we'll make that announcement when that happens. Um, but otherwise, thank you all for coming here virtually tonight. Uh, we are happy for you both to hear our speakers, but also uh, to join us and participate in these talks. So feel free, please, to ask questions both in the chat and the Q&A section uh, during the talk, and we will moderate it and ask our speakers. So anything you're curious about, uh, please let us know, and we will moderate that uh, in real time. Um, but otherwise, we're excited uh, tonight to hear first from Alicia, who is from the Electrical Engineering and Computer Sciences Department here at UC Berkeley. Uh, she grew up in Portland, Oregon, uh, and received a BS in electrical engineering uh, from Arizona State University in 2018, and now is currently working toward her PhD in electrical engineering and computer sciences, uh, for which uh, here at Berkeley, where she also received an MS degree uh, in the same uh, field in 2020. Uh, her research interests include low power machine or low power machine learning for biomedical devices, uh, hardware software co design for biosignal processing and classification, as well as exploration of novel brain inspired paradigms for 
and I hope I say this phrase with all <laughs> the proper uh, pronunciations and uh, cadence, but closed loop wearable interfaces, including neural prostheses. Um, she is the recipient of the NSF Graduate Research Fellowship, UC Berkeley Fellowship, UC Berkeley EX Excellence Award, and UC Berkeley Outstanding Graduate Mentor Award. And outside of research, she is also an accomplished theater actress and Indian classical dancer. So we are excited to have uh, such a well-rounded and accomplished scientist speaking with us today uh, and excited to hear about her work. So please, Alicia, take it away. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be speaking today. This is such a great opportunity. Um, and uh, as I said before, please feel free to ask questions at any time during the presentation um, about anything. If there's any terminology that um, I didn't explain clearly, please, please feel free to let me know and I'm happy to explain everything. Um, in a, hopefully a different way that does make sense. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so hi, today I'm gonna be talking about augmented prosthetics through multi-level control. Um, and this work is um, a co co uh, collaboration amongst many different researchers, including many undergraduate students, a postdoc in my lab, uh, my advisor and myself. Um, so one of the biggest motivations for this work is that generally with prosthetics or existing prosthetics, users have to use approximately 90% of their visual attention to focus on their prosthetic when they're doing any kind of a grasping task or any kind of interaction with the world around them. Um, and in general, the interfaces with these prosthetics are very, very difficult to use. Um, and there's a whole bunch of problems that come with them. Um, and some of these problems include dexterity limitations um, and also generally whatever control the prosthetic is doing, the burden of that falls on the user. Uh, for example, the weight of the prosthetic or doing fine motor control, the ability to decode that, that burden falls on the user who has to kind of try to emphasize certain behaviors in order to get the prosthetic to understand what it wants to do. Um, and then generally it relies on visual feedback. So when the prosthetic does something, um, the user needs to watch it very carefully to see what's happening and then adjust its behavior accordingly instead of the prosthetic doing that itself. Um, so overall, there's just a very large mental load to complete almost any kind of activity. Um, and this leads to up to a 75% abandonment rate of these prosthetics, which is a shame. So some of the existing features that do exist in these kind of prosthetics on the market um, first of all, there are kind of two sets of prosthetics. So there's one type of prosthetics that are purely mechanical, um, and these are used um, just through like buttons or things like that, which can rotate through a set of different grips. Um, so generally the set of grips that are selected are chosen based on what the user's general activities of daily living are. So if they tend to drive, for example, you would pick a, a grip like this, or if they tend to do laundry, you would pick more pinching grips. Um, so depending on what the user's behaviors are, these grips are sort of set in advance and customized to the user. Um, there is the method also of using EMG. Um, and so EMG is basically muscle signals that can be picked up on the surface of the arm. So when muscles are activated in the arm, an electrical signal passes from the brain to the arm through the muscles. And that electrical signal can be detected either under the skin or even over the skin. Um, so there are prosthetics that try to use that signal to actually control the grip or the uh, selection of the grip that the prosthetic is doing at the time. Um, through, through, the, through decoding of this information. So generally with these kind of features, given the set of grips that are available, you would expect that you know, the user would wanna take advantage of that. But unfortunately, users actually use only one grip available in their prosthetic 70% of the time. Um, and the reason for this is because it's difficult for them to actually switch grips. So the barrier to switching a grip is large enough for them to choose to stick to one most of the time. Um, additionally, for the EMG-based prostheses, unfortunately, the, the muscle signals that occur on the arm are really specific to different users. So there is a training phase required in order for the user to actually use the prosthetic with this control method. Um, and that training phase is kind of long. Um, and even while you wear the prosthetic, the, the ability to decode that information changes over time as well, because the sensors start moving around. Um, 
and you know, for example, sweat or um, things like that really actually start impacting the ability of the prosthetic to accurately decode the EMG information. Um, and again, overall, there's just a lack of an intuitive and reliable interface. So there are a few different approaches towards robotics in general. That's kind of a whole separate field uh, uh, called robotics. Um, and in that field, there is sort of an emerging area called reinforcement learning. So this is a method of optimal control where essentially there's an agent and there is some kind of uh, behavior that the agent should be achieving. Um, and so that behavior is assigned a certain reward. And then depending on how well they do that behavior, this reward is either higher or lower. Um, and the agent is able to sort of tune its behaviors or its selection of actions in order to maximize this reward. Um, so in this scenario, the prosthetic would be the agent and the reward would be accomplishing a certain task correctly. Um, and this is one way that people try to approach robotics. People do this often for, um, for example, uh, machinery or things like that. Um, however, this is something that we believe does not work well for this specific prosthetic application because of the fact that in this case, the agent, which is the prosthetic, kind of fully takes over the control of what is happening. So they, the agent is trained to achieve a certain reward. That reward is very specific to a certain scenario. Um, and the actions that are taken are completely controlled by the agent and the user does not really contribute to this. This. Um, also, in order for this agent to learn this, it takes a lot of data. Uh, and unfortunately, in the prosthetic case, we really don't have access to that much because every time the user takes on, uh, takes off and puts back on their prosthetic device, the sensors are in different locations. And so the, the system needs to either be retrained um, or, or sort of like quickly updated. Um, and that you cannot have the user spend hours recollecting data for the agent to relearn based on this scenario. Um, so as a whole, this approach does not address prosthetic needs. However, it is a separate field of interest for other applications um, and something that um, if you're interested, I would encourage you to look into. So the way that we're trying to approach this problem in our group is to implement what we call a shared control system. Um, and so essentially the idea here is that we sort of match or our sort of trade off between the prosthetic control and the user control. So we want the user to still be able to maintain their autonomy, but we don't want the burden of the device to fall on the user. We want it to fall on the device. Um, and so this specifically talks about finer controls, for example, picking up an object where it's difficult for the user to figure out exactly, you know, what amount of um, pressure to apply on the cup because they don't have any feedback coming back from their fingers. There's only the prosthetic doing this behavior. Here. So the burden of that, we want it to fall on the prosthetic itself. Um, and also we want to keep all of our uh, computation that we're doing very simple so that we can implement it on the prosthetic instead of having to stream data somewhere else to a computer, which then we have the computation done there and then sent back. So the way that we want to approach this is through this multi-layer prosthetic. Oh, I think I see a question. So. Um, okay, this seems to be a logistics question. Oh, sorry, Alicia, I'll I'll moderate questions, so no no need to moderate. Oh, great. I'll, okay. I'll make sure that <laughs> sorry. I'll I'll scan those for you. No worries. Okay, cool. Okay, I'll keep going then. Um, so yeah, so the way that we want to approach this is through this multi-layer prosthetic control um, scheme. Uh, and so essentially what we have here is we have these three layers of control. And at the bottom, we have the biosignal encoding. So in our case, we do want to use the EMG signal. So we're attempting to do an EMG based prosthetic, um, but we also have in our system an accelerometer, which essentially detects acceleration in the X, Y, and Z directions. Um, and so based on those two information at the current time and the, and the previous times, um, can we figure out some level of, of information about what the user's current um, state is? Uh, so for example, is the user doing a grip? Is the user so arm up here is the user's arm down here. Um, what amount of information can we get out of that? That is what we consider the biosignal encoding layer. So we want to translate essentially our sensor data into usable information. Our second layer is this intent prediction. So based on what we know now about what the user's current state is, where what is the gesture and what is the position of the arm, um, can we then infer what is what the user is actually trying to do? So what's the activity or the task that they're trying to accomplish? And based on that, we want to figure 
about, is this a task that requires the prosthetics assistance? And then at the top layer, we have our prosthetic control layer. So we want to map now, in this case, the high level information we've determined. So now we know what task the user is trying to do. So what exactly do we do to help the user in this case? What exactly is the assistance that we do? And we need to map that to the behavior that the prosthetic actually does. So for each motor in the prosthetic, what should it be doing to help the user at this current time? So the way that um, our group is approaching this problem is through this very specific method of computing. Um, and it's really kind of an emerging paradigm that has not yet um, become popular, but it is very quickly gaining traction. Um, and it's called hyperdimensional computing. This is an emerging brain inspired computing paradigm. So the way that this computation is done is through the something that looks very similar to the brain and that it's a very distributed representation. So the way that information is represented in hyperdimensional computing is as these very, very large vectors that we call hypervectors. Um, and so a vector is um, a string essentially or like a list of different numbers. Um, and so in our case, we actually tend to use binary hypervectors. So every spot in this vector is either a one or a zero. Uh, and the larger that these vectors get, uh, we essentially start seeing some interesting patterns. Um, and the first is that if you were to randomly generate one hypervector, and then you were to randomly generate a second hypervector, because these vectors are so large, the chance that these two vectors are, are the same, like they have their ones and zeros in the exact same spots, is almost zero. So what we call this is as orthogonality. So two randomly generated hypervectors are pretty much orthogonal. They're com in completely different sections of this um, sort of hyperdimensional space that we're creating with these vectors. Um, and so what this does is that uh, essentially now we have the ability to represent information on two different sides of a plane. And at a later time, if we see some information that's closer to one, then we know that it's, it's um, probably falling under some kind of class that the other vector was starting in. So there's a few different operations that we use on this. So this, for example, XOR, add, or right shift. Um, so we can do really simple operations on these hypervectors. Um, and because, because they're binary, these computations are extremely simple and very, very energy efficient, which is basically the key um, benefit of this paradigm. Uh, and so this is really the place where this paradigm adds benefit to the prosthetic application because we want to keep things very simple so that we can implement it locally in the prosthetic device. So we don't want something that is very, very large um, and going to take up a lot of battery or a lot of energy to actually accomplish. So there has been prior work with this algorithm um, and it's shown very high accuracy for a bunch of different applications, specifically with biosignals. So it's shown high accuracy for emotion recognition and prior work in my group has actually shown that it has very very high accuracy for emg gesture recognition um, and it's actually able to even do one-shot learning so you are able to recognize a gesture of emg signals just based on one example of that gesture which is a huge benefit over other types of learning algorithms um, and also we're able to quickly update these models on the fly. So if the, you take the sensor off and you put it back on, you again just show one example of a set of gestures and the whole model can quickly update to figure out um, how to understand the new sensor placement. So some of the key benefits here are very, very important for the prosthetic case. So the way that we're doing this, we wanna to try to take advantage of some of these traits that we've seen with HTC or hyperdimensional computing before, uh, which is that one, it works well with limited training data, which is important for our prosthetic case. Um, and also it's very low latency and we can do embedded training or inference, which means we're able to do the training and the learning on the device and the delay between seeing sensor information and getting an output is really, really small. Alicia, sorry, yes. I have a question and excuse my ignorance about use of prosthetics. Is it currently that users of prosthetics kind of have to train them every time they put them on and like for the gestures? And so this makes that training period much shorter? Yeah, so it, it, it again depends exactly on what type of prosthetic it is. But generally, if you do have an EMG based prosthetic, 
unless you have the sensor placement exactly the same every time you put it on, um, this is kind of a, uh, a sort of a necessary thing. There are prosthetics though, that this is kind of an area that is growing right now is where um, when you do get fitted for a prosthetic, they create this sort of, um, the, the fitting of it involves the sensor placement such that every time you put the prosthetic on, the entire system pretty much sits in exactly the same spot. So in this way, you are able to get those sensors in exactly the same place. Um, but one of the main limitations with this is that there are only two or three sensors in existing AMG-based prosthetics. So you really only are keeping track of three different muscles on the arm. Um, and this is why this is able to work. If you wanted to do more sophisticated gesture, gesture recognition with these EMG signals, you do need more information over the entire arm. And this is when this, this starts to become complicated. You're not as easily able to get sensors in exactly the same spot every time. Um, and so generally this is a problem that is seen um, in the research side, because as people are trying to experiment with different learning algorithms for you know, a set of larger number of sensors to try and really um, decode the EMG information well, um, it's, a, it's a struggle to have to you know do all of your data collection in like a you know one sitting because if you the second you take it off and put it back on you know things are kind of um not going to perform as well okay cool thank you okay i will go ahead so the first layer this top layer here this is the uh, actuation layer so this is the layer where we want to map the information that we've determined in the lower layers to the appropriate output actuation um, so this is something that we've been exploring in the group a little bit. Um, and one of the ways that we've been demonstrating this is through this task here. So we have this agent in blue, which is here, trying to navigate to the goal, which is in green here. Um, and so there's 15 randomly placed obstacles, which are shown in black all over this um, map here, this 10 by 10 grid. Um, and what we consider a success in this case is that the agent is able to reach the goal while avoiding all of the obstacles goals within a limited, uh, within a certain period of time. So the sensors that we've included here uh, include obstacles in the cardinal direction. So we have one up, down, left, right. Um, and then also our goal X and Y direction. So is the goal up or down and is the goal left or right? Um, and then we also keep track of the agent's last move so that it doesn't repeat any behaviors. So this top layer of our prosthetic um, control scheme um, involves primarily this sort of like sensor fusion of information. So we're trying to combine the information that we determine from our EMG, from our accelerometer, and then also from the tasks that we've determined the user's trying to accomplish. And we're trying to map this all to now the correct behavior on the agent's part. Uh, and here the agent is the prosthetic. So for this way, for this problem, for this 2D navigation task, what this looks like is we have the obstacle sensors and then we have our target sensors and our last move. And there's a few different ways to really include or kind of combine this information. So the first way is modality based. So here we have combined all of our obstacles first, all of our targets first, and then our last move. So there's sort of an equal weight here between our obstacles and our goal sensors. The second way is this directional thing where we have this equal weight between our X direction and our Y direction thing. So these are the obstacles and the goals in the X direction and the obstacles and the goals in the Y direction. Um, and then we keep track of the last move. And these are now equally weighted. And then the third way is this sort of constraints versus goal weighting. So in this case, we have our obstacles are combined and then all of our other information is combined separately. So what we consider our constraints are the obstacles. So these are directions that you don't want to go in. Um, and then what we have considered as our goals is our target. So this is the direction you do want to go in. However, in this mapping, based on the operations that we do, we're weighting our obstacles much, much more than their goals. And so the output hypervector that we get uh, more considers the obstacle information than the goal information. And we see a very, very stark um, performance success rate change in these different encoding methods, which really shows how much the way that we include the information and combine the information impacts the performance of the system. So the modality-based method performs pretty poorly at around 46%. We get a 15% increase with the directional encoding. And then after that, we get a very significant, almost 
percent increase um, with the constraints versus goal encoding. And this kind of makes sense for this problem because the, because of the way that we've defined it, we consider the agent hitting an obstacle as a failure. However, we don't um, we want the the agent to get to the goal, but we're prioritizing first um, avoiding an obstacle so that we don't fail the task immediately. So this is uh, kind of a showcase of that. So with this example, we've kind of shown that we can do this intelligent sensor fusion. Um, and what this allows us to do is incorporate this knowledge of the overall goals and constraints of the task into the encoding scheme itself so that we're able to better get performance out of the um, encoding um, method. And overall, this can be accomplished with three total operations. So this level of expressiveness can be achieved with very, very simple computation. So for the prosthetic shared control case, what we want to do is classify the user's real-time task or goal based on feed forward information, which is the EMG and the accelerometer. And then we use feedback information such as force sensors or um, anything that's on the prosthetic to then assist the user with completion of the task through this algorithm and this top layer of control. So what are the sensors that we have in the system? There's quite a few. Um, so essentially in my group previously, we had this EMG data collection system. So that includes this array here that you can see. Um, and this is essentially an electrode array. So these are conductive. And when you put them on the arm, if there's an electrical signal that it detects underneath that, that can be detected um, through these conductive traces. Um, and then digitized by processing on a, um, on a board. So in my work, we've added these four sensors into this system. So we added these five four sensors, um, and this is called a printed circuit board. Uh, and essentially this is where, this is what this board is. So here we have a battery, and then here we have the connectors, and this connector is this thing. And we have these physical four sensors that we can plug into that. Um, and then on top of that, we have some other hardware going on here to try and um, sort of stabilize the signals that we're seeing and make sure that it can be consumed by the uh, board that's sitting on top here appropriately. So the entire system on an arm looks like this. It's a little bit duct taped right now um, because we haven't figured out exactly how to get it to stay on the arm yet. We think some kind of arm band or something like that would be a good way to do this. But for now, we're using tape. Um, so this is the uh, flexible EMG sensor array. So you'll notice that in this case, we actually have 64 sensors aboard this thing, which is significantly more than what existing prosthetics have. Um, and one of the reasons that we've done this in the group is because we think that by having this um, full coverage over the entire arm, even if you do take off and put back on the sensors, you will have at least one electrode covering a muscle that's relevant. Um, or the muscles that are relevant. Um, so the high concentration of electrodes makes it possible to um, not have to care so much about how exactly where you put the electrode array onto the arm. Um, and then we have the accelerometer. So this is again, detecting acceleration, the X, Y, and Z plane. So this tells us is the arm moving. Um, and it also allows us to kind of detect where the arm position is like to what angle. Um, so that is sitting on the wrist here. And then these are the four sensors that go onto the fingers. So in an actual prosthetic system, you know, um, this would be, these four sensors would actually be going onto the prosthetic as opposed to onto the user's hand. So um, to start, oh, yes. Sorry, um, if I may interject with another question. Mm -hmm. um, I know there's like a lot of work done over like recent decades to make prosthetics very light um how much more like weight does this sort of system add back when people are like functionally using these prosthetics so i think generally the biggest weight tends to come from things like the motors and the battery um so this system itself is is quite light i don't have an exact number for the weight but overall this i think is much lighter than any of the prosthetics that i've ever um seen and primarily it's because you have battery or you have motors on the physical prosthetics. And that's what really tends to contribute to the weight. Um, so I don't think that something like this would really be the primary factor. Um, additionally, a lot of the processors already have, uh, a lot of the prosthetics already have processors on board. 
Um, so something like this, if it was to be integrated into an actual prosthetic, we would wanna try to integrate um, this for some kind of sensor array into the prosthetic, but the processing that's being done right now over here could be done on the prosthetics uh, existing processor, for example. So even that would not necessarily be adding on top of it. Um, and the four sensors weigh very, very, very little. All right, that's interesting, thank you. So to do some experimentation with the algorithms that we use, we first wanted to actually collect some data um, of EMG signals for a set of activities of daily living. So some of the prior work that has been done in the group and that tends to be done generally with EMG-based gesture recognition is very static. So for example, this versus this versus this or this, um, it's very static gestures that people are trying to recognize and get um, uh, a actuator to recreate. Um, unfortunately for the prosthetic case, it's not that simple because uh, we have sort of this continuous motion or behaviors that are happening over time. Um, so if a user is trying to do folding, trying to fold laundry, for example, they're not going to be like this and then this, you know, they're, they're going to be picking things up and folding it and then putting it down. Um, so there's a much more sort of continuous set of EMG signals that's coming by. Um, and it's very temporal. So we want to collect data uh, along the lines of those things to see if we can figure out and understand and decode the information that's coming from the user, um, even in that scenario. So we started out with six, six activities of daily living. So one of them is um, writing with a pen. We have tying shoelaces, combing hair, screwing a light bulb, um, uh, opening a jar, and then folding a shirt. So each of these activities, the way that we've uh, approached this is we actually break them down into subtasks. Um, and each of them, each of these subtasks really corresponds to what we would expect or require a change in prosthetic actuation. Um, and so totally across these six activities of daily living, we have 74 subtasks. Um, and so far we've collected five full protocols across three different subjects. So five full run-throughs of this entire um, six activities of daily living for three different subjects. So right now what we're working on is actually the lowest layer. So we have our low level perception through hyperdimensional computing. So we've collected our EMG information, the accelerometer information. So can we actually decode this continuous behavior that we're seeing that we've just collected in this data set? Um, and so the way that we do this is that right now over five seconds, so each of our subtasks are set up to uh, occur over five seconds, which based on the sampling rate of our system gives us a hundred samples for each of these subtasks. Um, so we wanna encode each of these five seconds um, and get one hypervector that comes out of this representing that subtask. Um, and then we wanna try and classify and figure out what is the subtask that's occurring using this hypervector. So this is kind of shown in this figure here for the light bulb case. So in the case that we are grasping this light bulb and then we're reaching and then we're actually screwing it into the light bulb. These are two, three different subtests that are happening. So what we would do is we would do our feature extraction um, and then following the hyperdimensional co uh, computing and coding process, we would get this one hypervector that represents this grasp, grasping behavior across the five seconds. And we would do the same thing for the reaching and the twisting. Um, and then using some of our trained example hypervectors for these behaviors, we would try to figure out what is the user actually doing for the time. So generally when we do our data collection, we actually collect five examples of the same behaviors. So for each of these, we have five examples. Uh, and so the way that we verify our system is that we train on four of the examples and then we test on one of them. And we rotate which one we test on so we get five different accuracy numbers. Um, and we would get an average across those five to see how well the system does overall. And so here is kind of the, uh, the results that we have at the current moment. Um, so this figure really shows actually for each of our activities, what is the accuracy for three different subjects. So you can see we get some variation, you know, some subjects seem to be much better at, you know, replicating folding laundry um, very well versus 
Uh, other subjects seem to be, for example, much better at tying shoelaces very um, consistently. So there's definitely some ups and downs across the different activities. Um, but overall, across all the activities, we actually get very high task recognition accuracy. Um, and so this is determined by seeing if the subtests that we classify correspond to the correct overall activity. Um, and so what we see is that right now we're able to, with 91% accuracy, recognize the user's overall task using just the EMG channels. Um, and we're able to recognize the user's intent even at the start of the activity. So in this figure, we show the similarity between our trained hypervectors for each of the different subtasks within a certain activity. So for example, within folding laundry, we have eight subtasks. So these are eight, the eight different rows and these are the eight different, um, the same eight different rows. Um, and so what this, this giant matrix tells us is for example, at this point, what is the similarity between writing with the pen of this subtask versus writing with the pen of this subtask, which is why down the diagonal, everything is extremely similar because these are the exact same, this is the same thing. Um, so what this really tells us is how similar are different activities. So the darker it is, the more similar it looks. Um, and so what we kind of see here is that within a certain activity, things look generally very similar. So we get this sort of like darker coloring within certain activities, which really tells us that um, these activities, the overall EMG signals look very similar within a certain activity. And what we believe this is due to is the arm position of the user for these activities. So for example, while combing hair, the arm is gonna be up here, whereas tying shoelaces, you're gonna be bending down and your arm is gonna be um, you know, towards your feet. Um, so that arm position actually really influences the EMG signals that you get, which is why we believe that there is such a stark contrast between different activities, which allows us to you know, very accurately predict what the activity the user is trying to accomplish. So overall, um, there's a lot of future work left to be done here. This is really just the start of our work. Um, primarily, we want to continue to explore subtest classification so we can tell what activity the user is trying to accomplish, but how well and how um, better can we figure out exactly what the user is doing within this activity at a certain time. Um, and this, I think, is going to require recognition of temporal patterns. So we believe we want to try to incorporate some prior knowledge about the order of the activities that the user is likely to accomplish to try and figure out what is most likely to come next. Um, so this will allow us to try to integrate some knowledge about the long-term goal into some of the um, inference that we're doing. Um, and then also we'd like to try to really visualize the behavior of a prosthetic in a simulation environment and then also with a physical hardware um, to try and map this uh, and get some visual feedback for the user. So these are all of the people that have been working um, on this project with me. So I just wanna say thank you to all of them. Um, and there's a wide, wide range of people, a wide variety of people from different backgrounds, um, including BioE students, physics, and EECS. Um, and all of these people have, have done really, really great work on this project. And this type of project really requires people from a lot of different backgrounds. So um, it's been a blessing to work on this, and um, I'm very glad to have worked with all of them. Uh, so these are some of the acknowledgements. These are some of the people that have helped with the project in the group. Um, and also some of the funding of this project. And with that, I will take any questions. Great, thank you so much, Alicia. That was super interesting and uh, definitely expanded my knowledge of where prosthetics technology is at the current time, which is something I didn't know much about. Um, so I'm happy to moderate questions that are coming through and we've already got one. Um, so our first question from Joseph is asking, do you believe your EMG signal approach could be more practical for prosthetics rather than coding signals directly from the user's brain? So efforts that are using kind of neuro simulation versus uh, muscle stimulation. Yeah, this is a really good question, Joseph. Um, so yes, <laughs> um, and the biggest reason is because uh, Right now, some of the things that you can get from the surface of the brain really um, are not specific to really um, different areas of the brain exactly. Uh, and so we know some of these things that have to do with, um, you know, motor control are, um, you know, in parts, specific parts of the brain. To get to those, it to get, you know, um, 
a, a little bit more insight into what's actually happening in the brain. Usually surface-based electrodes on the brain are, are not sufficient, um, which is why there's a huge effort into implanted um, you know, um, systems inside the brain. So there's a, a, a very popular person named Elon Musk who's trying to do uh, this company called Neuralink, which he's implanting things into the brain. Um, there are a few other companies that do similarly um, efforts along the lines of this. Um, but of course, these kind of things are, you know, very, very involved and require surgery on the part of the user. Um, and I believe that they will be um, more accurate approaches in the future. Um, I think maybe like a decade from now. Um, but at the current moment, I don't think these things are practically feasible. So being able to do things on the surface, even in the case that you do have this kind of, um, you know, safe and reliable implanting of sensors into the brain, even in the case of that, I think having things that can just be done on the surface um, is, is always a good place to start and definitely will have its place. Um, and right now, I think it's definitely um, easier and, and more accessible for any kind of system to be able to use those signals. Um, and at the current moment, there's a lot of success using these signals as well. Um, so for the prosthetic application specifically, um, if you have access to those kind of signals, that is a huge benefit and, and definitely can be used well to achieve most of the things that you want the prosthetic to achieve. Um, there's some other things that do need to be taken account into account. For example, if you're working with an actual amputee, it's possible that um, the signals or the muscles have atrophied, for example. So you may not get the same patterns that you would get with somebody who's not an amputee. So there are things like that. And these systems do need to be adapted specifically for the case of amputees. Um, but in those cases, um, even, the, even the brain signals, for example, may also face the same challenges. Uh, but anyway, the primary thing is that you don't need to implant something. And that's really, I think, the main benefit of something like this. Yeah, that seems to be a huge limitation for a lot of sensor-based uh, engineering um, materials. Jenna, did you want to ask your question uh, in first? Sure. Sorry if I missed this, but do you track finger movement as well in addition to the arm position? Or um, Yeah, so, so generally with EMG-based gesture recognition, you can actually get, you know, specific finger movement. Um, part of the challenge, I think, is getting this continuous motion. So we can easily tell if somebody's doing this versus this, but can we mm -hmm. tell if somebody's doing this versus this? You know, oh, that's okay. that's a much smaller difference. So that's the kind of challenges that is re that are really there with the EMG. Um, and in those cases, you're really looking for like changes. You know, this kind of like mm -hmm. sequences of behavior that really varies between different users and that really varies even for a specific user they may not do it the exact same way every time um so those those kind of things are really the more difficult ones but yeah definitely we do look for finger movements and especially in the case of the prosthetic i think more what we're looking for is like grasps so is the user doing this versus like this and that's you know really where the prosthetic can contribute in terms of assistance um and especially in the grasping case that's you know the user does not get feedback. For us, it's easy, you know, or at least for me, it's easy like to, you know, you pick up a bottle, you can feel, okay, the bottle is here, right? If, you, if you're you using a prosthetic, you can't feel that you've made contact with the bottle. You need to watch it and pick it up, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and you can't tell if it's slipping unless you're, you know, really keeping an eye on it. Um, so those are the kind of things that we want to automate. So if we can figure out what grasp the user is trying to do, then we can automate, you know, squeezing until you, you know, get contact on the force sensor for example, and then the prosthetic can do that by itself. Um, so those are the kind of things that um, that are particularly for the prosthetic case more useful, but yeah, part of that is figuring out where the fingers are. Okay, cool, thank you, that was super informative. Okay, um, yeah, I think currently that's as many questions as we have coming in, um, but Alicia will be around during the next talk. So if anyone thinks of anything they want to know about prosthetics in the meantime, uh, feel free to ask it in the chat. And I'm sure she would be happy to answer there. Um, but as a last round, thank you so much, Alicia. That was a super interesting talk. Um, of course, this will be archived along with Gregory's, um, but we'll send out uh, resources that Alicia has given us uh, with our end of seminar email if any of this interests you. Um, 
So for now, I'll hand it over to Jenna uh, to introduce our next speaker. Hey, great. So we'd like to welcome Gregory from the Institute for Neurodegenerative Diseases at UCSF. So Greg's dad was in the Air Force, so he had the opportunity to grow up all over the country, Georgia, Texas, California, and Virginia. And in undergrad, he studied microbiology and did influenza research to discover new drugs. Currently, Greg is a fourth year graduate student in Martin Kampman's lab at UCSF. Greg has three kids who keep him quite busy outside of lab. They like to hike, go to the beach, and just enjoy the beautiful place they live in. So with that, we'd like to welcome Greg. Hi, thank you. Um, is the screen correct? Are you looking at the right screen? Yes, we can see it okay. and we hear you well. Awesome, great. So uh, yes, I'm at UCSF um, and I'm excited to tell you about my work, which is trying to understand what this protein called tau does uh, in the context of dementia. So um, dementia is the progressive loss of brain function. And um, most of us who are watching this know someone who is suffering or has suffered from dementia and they truly are terrible diseases. Um, here, I'm actually just showing some paintings that were done by an artist who was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And uh, at the time, he decided to paint a self-portrait of him, uh, a self-portrait every year. Um, and he did that for uh, as long as he was able to. And you can actually just see quite uh, hauntingly in his art, uh, he, I think, captured his experience with uh, the disease. So this pr progressive loss of brain function is caused by the death of brain cells. And so here's a picture of a normal brain. We have both the exterior on top and then a cross section on the bottom. And then um, looking at an Alzheimer's disease brain, you can see it's smaller. It looks kind of shrunken and, and shriveled. And in the cross section, I think you can really clearly appreciate that um, there are pretty big differences in the, the structure of the brain. And this is due to brain cells actually dying. Um, so dementia is actually an umbrella term. Uh oh, there we go. Um, and it, there's actually lots of different kinds of diseases that are under this category of dementia. And so uh, four really well-known ones include Alzheimer's disease, ALS, frontotemporal dementia, and Parkinson's disease. And these diseases all have very distinct symptoms. So Alzheimer's is most commonly associated with memory loss. ALS causes paralysis. Frontotemporal dementia causes um, very stark behavior and personality changes. And Parkinson's disease causes uh, tremors and like involuntary motion. And the reason why these diseases have such distinct uh, symptoms is because uh, they affect different regions of the brain. Um, which I've illustrated here kind of at a high level. And so it's these uh, brain regions and their loss that are responsible for the, the different uh, outcomes in the diseases. So now I'm gonna zoom in even more from the whole brain to some of the players uh, involved uh, and introduce you to some of the cell types. So um, the one of the, and sorry if this is flashing, I hope that's okay. <laughs> But um, uh, one of the main cell types in the brain are neurons, and they are responsible for relaying information between brain cells. And so what you're actually seeing in this video, this is a zebrafish brain. Um, and you can see that the, when the neurons are flashing, they're actually firing action potentials. So similar to the, um, Alicia's talk earlier where she was talking about the electrical signals. Um, and you can visualize this, which is pretty cool. And um, yeah, so they're responsible for learning and memory and controlling your muscles. And um, then there are other types of cells in the brain and, and these are co collectively called glia. And so glia are responsible for supporting and, and protecting and managing neurons. And so this um, image on the left is, is a, a microglia, which is actually doing surveillance. And so it's actually probing around, making sure that everything around it is functioning properly. Um, and then another th cool thing that microglia do is they actually kill and eat stuff. So this microglia on the right is actually about to kill and eat uh, the cell on the left. Um, and so, yeah, glia are really fascinating and do a lot of cool things. And these movies were taken by my uh, colleague, Olivia Teeter, um, here at UCSF. So um, 
just this is just kind of fun. And basically, our our field we have kind of this back and forth, uh, and we kind of rib each other a little bit. So I primarily study neurons, and so and historically the field has kind of viewed glia as sort of like butlers, and like the neurons are like the real where it's all happening, and and that's the most important thing. And what we've really come to appreciate over the last few years is that this is actually not the case, and sort of the glia perspective where neurons are these like very needy and uh, <laughs> fragile cells and the glia are actually these puppeteers controlling everything um, has, is kind of the more in vogue view nowadays. And I think really what's happening is kind of a combination of both. Um, and so just to kind of give you the big picture view in the brain, you have the blood brain barrier, which uh, separates your brain from the rest of your body um, and um, connected to that. Uh, are astrocytes, which are uh, another type of glia, and they support the blood-brain barrier and also support neurons, um, which I've already introduced. And uh, I'm just highlighting a scientist uh, that is a, a, a legend in the field um, who unfortunately has passed away, but uh, Ben Barris was a, a pioneer in, in studying astrocytes. Um, and then, I, as I showed you earlier, microglia, which are kind of the resident immune cells and uh, making sure everything's going uh, well. And then Beth Stevens is a, is a, is a really uh, a star in, in the field studying microglia right now. So these are what these cells kind of look like in, in a healthy context. And in a diseased context, everything is actually going wrong all at once. <laughs> so the blood-brain barrier is disrupted, and you have things leaking into the brain that should not be there. Um, astrocytes actually become reactive and are no longer uh, supporting the blood-brain barrier or the neurons, and they're actually actively damaging things. And then microglia also become activated and start eating things that they're not supposed to be eating. Um, so there's, and all of these contribute to neurons dying. <laughs> um, so zooming in on the neurons, um, so for a long time, for over 100 years, we've known that there's uh, the, these pathologies, or what I'm going to call gunk, um, is linked to dementia. And these are associated with um, neurons. And just for your reference, uh, there's two ways you can get dementia, either through a familial mutation, which is something that you get from your parents, or mo in most cases, it's actually just sporadic, which just means um, either mutations or, or insults that you acquire over your lifetime cause the disease. And so um, in Alzheimer's disease, which I'm showing on the left, you have uh, these mutations which lead to amyloid pathology or gunk. And amyloid uh, pathology are these like extracellular plaques that form outside of cells. And then this leads to tau pathology, uh, which are these intracellular tangles that form inside of neurons. And um, these cause neurons to die. And in a very related disease, frontotemporal dementia, um, you actually have mutations in tau itself. And so you don't have the amyloid pathology, but you still get these tangles inside of neurons and that leads to neuron death. And interestingly, even though it's the same protein that's killing the neurons, um, you, it affects different regions of the brain. So you have these very different um, symptoms. So what is tau? Uh, and before I can introduce tau, I have to introduce microtubules. Um, so microtubules are the cell's skeleton. Um, and they also are the highway of the cell. And so uh, here, this is just a little video showing a motor protein that's trafficking cargo along a microtubule on the bottom. And so what tau does in neurons is it coats microtubules, um, especially in axons. But uh, that's kind of, we don't really know what tau does and why it's there. Uh, we just know that it uh, binds to microtubules. We've studied this like very heavily for decades and we, it still isn't like a consensus. Um, but we do know that it causes dementia. Um, so now I've given you a really brief introduction to tau. So the next question is why does tau form tangles in neurons? And so to understand this, we have to look at kind of like how proteins work. And so proteins, most proteins are very structured. They have a, a fold. And I think a good analogy is to think of like a rope being tied into a very specific knot and that that knot has a, a function. Um, but there's also some proteins, including tau, which are actually disordered. And so they don't have a specific knot that they get uh, tied up into. They're just kind of uh, sampling lots of different states. And so um, 
tau and actually a lot of these other disordered proteins can very easily form tangles which i'm illustrating here with this fishing line and um you can imagine right away with this analogy why a tangle would be a problem because now this protein is no longer able to do its normal function. And in fact, it's actually preventing the entire apparatus, in this case, the fishing rod from functioning uh, because you can't reel it in at all. And so what I focus on in my work is understanding why is tau toxic in disease? And uh, the technology we use to address this question is we use I, uh, induced stem cells or iPSCs um, from patients who have familial mutations uh, in tau. And so the way these work is you can uh, grab some skin cells with a biopsy, and you can turn those skin cells into stem cells. And then we can use CRISPR to edit uh, and correct the mutation. And then now we have a pair of stem cells uh, that the only difference between them is this mutation in tau and everything else about them is the same. And so now we have this really clean genetic model to study what are the effects specifically of the tau mutation on, on, on these neurons. And uh, another thing we do in our lab with this system is we use CRISPR to do unbiased um, screens. And so traditional CRISPR uh, has this protein Cas9 binding a guide RNA, which targets the protein to a region of DNA, um, which I'm illustrating here. And then Cas9 cuts DNA, and this lets you edit it. And so uh, I'm illustrating that here where you know we're cutting out this red gene uh, with Cas9. Um, and this was uh, characterized by Jennifer Doudna, and I'm going to mispronounce her name, so I won't try it, but they just won the Nobel Prize, um, and it's beautiful work. So um, what we actually use uh, is a, a newer system called CRISPR-I, which doesn't actually cut DNA, it just uh, turns it down or knocks it down. And so uh, we mutate Cas9 so it can't cut anymore, uh, but it can still bind the guide RNA, so it still binds to a target DNA sequence, um, but then it's fused to this repressor, which just knocks down the gene. Um, and so the gene is still there. It's still expressed, but it's just expressed at a very low level. Um, and so we use this system now uh, to uh, infect our stem cells with guide RNAs. So each stem cell has a, a different gene knocked down. And then um, we can turn these stem cells into neurons and study what are the effects of knocking down these um, in a healthy neuron or in a neuron that has this mutation in tau and is diseased. Um, and I think for time, maybe I should, I'll say this real quick. <laughs> so we can you know, do these screens in parallel. We're looking at young, healthy neurons versus young, diseased neurons. And then we compare that to old, healthy neurons and old, diseased neurons. So we can collect these two time points. And then we look at we just basically count the cells and say, okay, um, for each guide RNA, um, does it either become enriched over time? Is it beneficial to knock down this gene or is it disappearing over time? And it's actually really toxic to knock down this gene. Um, and from that, we can calculate uh, the effect of knocking down the gene on survival. And we can, uh, if it's consistent across guides, we can get, um, you know, significance. And when we compare both of these, uh, experiments together, we can find um, hopefully disease-specific genes that will tell us about the mechanism. And so here I'm showing you an actual screen that we did looking uh, in our neurons. Um, on the x-axis is the screen in disease neurons, and on the y-axis is the screen in healthy neurons. And um, here you can see right away that most of the genes that when you knock them down, it correlates between the two, which is what you would expect. But really excitingly and gratifyingly, we found genes, which I'm highlighting in red, that were very specific to uh, either the healthy neurons or the diseased neurons. And what's really, really cool and highlights the power of the system is um, in this circled region here, five of these seven genes actually have the same function. So you get a lot of specificity uh, from, from these types of experiments, which is really exciting. So uh, really quickly, I'll just give you a flavor for some of the things we've learned from doing these types of experiments. Um, and the main takeaway is that mutant tau causes mitochondrial changes in neurons. So I'm just showing you a video of a neuron with mitochondria, uh, just so you can appreciate how cool these organelles are. Um, the mitochondria, as many of you will know, is uh, canonically known as the powerhouse of the cell. Um, 
And so it's providing energy uh, and neurons need a lot of energy. And so mitochondria play a really important role in um, neurons. Another weird thing about neurons, uh, and this is kind of a weird video, but basically I'm just trying to highlight that neurons are super long. And so the mitochondria have to travel very long distances to supply energy um, to you know, the whole cell. Um, and so what we found was that uh, when you have mutant tau, you actually have about twice as much mitochondria um, as a healthy neuron. And when you have uh, twice as much mutant tau around, um, it makes this even more so. And so um, we did a bunch of experiments to try and under uncover why this might be. And we actually found that um, this is through uh, neuronal activity. And so just a brief intro to that, um, uh, neurons fire action potentials along their axon. And then when it gets to the end of the cell, um, it hits the synapse, which is when one neuron touches another neuron. And uh, this causes a bunch of uh, these cargo vesicles to be released and release calcium. And then the next neuron uh, actually senses that and that activates it and causes it to fire an action potential. And what we found was when we knocked down grin 2 a which is one of these sensory um, proteins uh, in the uh, post-synapse, the receiving cell, um, it actually totally rescues the mitochondrial phenotype uh, in, the, in the mutant diseased neurons um, without affecting the, the healthy neurons at all. So that was really exciting. And, and now we have this model where mutant tau is causing these changes in the synapse um, and it's increasing energy demand. So there just is this increased need for mitochondria um, which is causing the changes in mitochondria. And what we don't know, and I'm still working on and trying to understand is how does tau cause these changes in the synapse and how do, does any of this contribute to toxicity in neurons or neurodegeneration? Um, and with that, I'd like to thank my lab, my boss, Martin, and uh, my amazing colleagues, and then obviously my family for all their support. And uh, I didn't put on here, but we also have funding, which makes this all possible. So yeah happy to answer any questions and I hope I didn't talk too fast. <laughs> no, you're good. Thank you so much, Greg. This was a really great talk and very enlightening about current state of um, research on Tau um, and yeah, what you've learned about. So yeah, if there's a couple of questions quickly in the chat or Q&A, um, we can ask or feel free to ask here and oh, there's one right away. So the question is, the pathways to dementia that you describe, such as cell mutation, seem unrelated to lack of brain activity in older people. Do you think brain training games may not really address the problem of dementia? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we use uh, these mutations in Tau because it's a very simple reductionist model. Um, and, and in reality, these diseases are dizzyingly complex. Um, and so uh, I, I don't have a lot of experience with the brain training games, but um, I think if the research out there says that those do help, um, then I would believe that they do. And this is a very different system. This is just, we're trying to understand what does tau do um, in the context of disease. And so if, for example, in that context, um, not using your brain causes, leads to decline and tau pathology, then that, you know, then you might have Great. Great. And then we'll take maybe last question from Madison. So Madison, Madison says that she knows mitochondria gets recycled over time. Do you know if these dementia or high tau neurons are making more mitochondria or getting worse at recycling them or both? Yeah, that's a, so that was the first question we had too, was, you know, we see twice as many mitochondria and those are kind of the ways you might see that. Is, is it just, are they just making more or are they just degrading it less and why would that be? And so it turns out they aren't making them faster. They're making them at the same rate uh, and they are degrading them more slowly in the diseased neurons. And uh, we thought maybe that was that, that tau is directly blocking the cell from being able to recycle them, but it turns out that's not the case. So the cell is actually just turning down its degradation of mitochondria so that um, it can have more available because it needs the energy. That's kind of the model we have right now based on the data. Okay, 
Awesome. Thanks for answering the questions, Greg. And um, if anybody has more questions for Greg or Alicia, like feel free to reach out to them or email us with your questions. And we'll be sending up a follow up of the talks within our upcoming newsletter with the recording and some fun facts about them. Um, but I'd like to thank Greg and Alicia again for two awesome and exciting talks and um, into very important fields of research. So thank you again for coming out and taking the time to speak with us. Thank you so much. These were just great talks. Thank you. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Uh,